Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining. I'm your host, Mickey Angeline, with the Women's International Music Network, and this is our podcast series, Live Front and Center, where we highlight incredible women in the music industry on every aspect. And our guest today, she covers a lot of those aspects, even as a solo artist. I am talking about the one, the only, Elise Solberg. Thank you so much for being here today with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so thrilled to be here with you. Connection is key, and you and I... It was so serendipitous. We connected on that podcast back at NAM with the women of NAM. And that was last minute for me because Laura Whitmore, our founder here at the Women's International Music Network, hit me up right before I left and said, can you do this podcast? I was like, absolutely. A podcast for NAM? Are you kidding? And then you happened to be one of the other speakers. I was so inspired by everything that you said. I knew I had to grab you and interview you to share with the world all the wonderful things you do, right? Because you're pianist, composer, songwriter, uh, producer, entrepreneur. That's like five things so far. So, <laughs> and, and where is it you're, you're broadcasting from today? I am in Burbank, California. All righty. We're on the same yep. time zone. I'm up north in Sacramento. Awesome. And nice. so in your bio, you're born in Tokyo, Japan, and you grew up in Denver, Colorado, and now you're in Southern California. Has that impacted at all with uh, your experiences and, and influence when you're writing and composing. Absolutely. I think that wherever you're, you know, situated, you can draw inspiration from, you know, wherever. So definitely my early experiences in, in Japan, I was there for eight years until we moved out to Denver. Um, and one of the focuses of uh, my piano lessons there, I studied at a place called the Yamaha uh, Academy, I think. And they have this program for uh, students where they are intensely trained in piano and um, like ensemble performances, but they also focus a lot on composition as well. So I was made to, you know, compose a lot of different things, even in just my one year studying there. Um, so that was a very early exposure. I think I was like seven and writing music. And I didn't write consistently throughout like my childhood. Like when I moved to Denver, it was more like piano. But as soon as I started studying with um, my teacher, Richard Holbrook, uh, shout out to him, he's great. Um, then I started writing again and he had me writing in different styles and things. So it was, it was great. You know, he he had so many different genres that he wanted me to try. So that was definitely an inspiration for me. And and when did you come out to the uh, Southern California? That was 2014. Yeah, yeah. That wasn't that long ago. Well, I say that, but that's actually eight years ago. <laughs> Oh my gosh, 2022, almost 22. I have to remember these things. Okay. And then so, okay, perfect. And then with everything that you do, we'll get into some questions here. Um, I would like to ask you, especially being, you know, um, a, a woman of color in the industry, what is, rep how important is representation to you? And what does that mean to you specifically in, especially in the genres that you play? Oh my gosh. It, it means absolutely everything. Um, when I first started, I, uh well in popular music i studied for one year at usc the popular music program with my mentor uh, patrice russian she's amazing um and when i was in the program it was pretty evenly split up between like men and women um and so there's like a good amount of female instrumentalists so i was like this is so awesome and then i go out into the real world <laughs> um and start working and it's like wow, I'm the only girl in the room. Uh, sometimes it wasn't always because I've been blessed to play with artists like Beyonce and Chloe and Halle who advocate for uh, gender equality and having women in their bands. Um, but in some other situations, I'm like, wow, this is, uh, <laughs> this is how it is, I guess. Um, so it means everything because um, growing up, I don't think a lot of young girls see themselves on stages because these stages a lot of times have all men and uh, it's it's hard to see yourself in those roles if you don't 
see someone that looks like you. And especially as an Asian woman, I can only list on like my five fingers, like keyboardists, like Asian American female keyboardists that are working in the same capacity that I do. 100%. I mean, I'm half Filipino and the representation there is next to none. I think growing up for me, the first person I remember being so like, this is something I could do in a field because I'm like I mentioned earlier, I don't normally mention age of my the people I'm interviewing, but I'll mention mine for for context because I'll be 54 this month. So my high school years are the 80s and fame. The TV show came out shortly after the film and Nia Peoples, Filipino singer, songwriter, actress, dancer. And I saw her. And that was the first time I realized I could do something like that, you know? And then in the 90s, it was Paula Abdul, you know? Short little woman of color, just kicking ass with choreography and dance and all that, right? She starts working with Janet Jackson. She starts working with these artists, and then she comes out with her own album, albums. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I still can do this. And I'm naming only two in a 20-year span, Right. Right. And now here we are 2022 and you're mentioning how you can name maybe five. The struggle. I mean, we've come a long way, but we still have such further way to go. Right. Absolutely. And then so you mentioned playing with big artists because you played with Beyonce. Can we talk about that? (laughs) You played with Beyonce, um, the 2022 Grammy performance. Please walk us through because it just blows my mind how you ended up with that gig. Yeah, that was that was a surprise. Um, it was actually the Academy Awards, um, and um, it was kind of mind blowing because we have to go back four years, uh, four years ago, right after I graduated. Uh, actually, it was a little before I graduated. I saw a post online, and I had no idea who it was for, but they said we're looking for female instrumentalists to back an artist for their upcoming performances. And so I just submitted my audition videos, didn't know what to expect. Um, The people from the team hit me back uh, and they're like, hey, can you come in tomorrow for the rest of the week? And it was kind of just like, whoa, that was kind of fast. Um, (laughs) And I couldn't do it, unfortunately, because I had a gig, but, Three months later, this was like March of 2018, but three months later in June, um, they hit me back and they said, hey, we have something coming up and are you available? I said, yeah, I'm I'm available. I just graduated. Uh, So I ended up doing the uh, MTV Movie and TV Awards with Chloe and Hallie. That was my first ever gig with them. Um, And I connected with their music director, Derek Dixie, who's amazing. Um, And ever since then, I've been working with them. And then all of a sudden this year, you know, a lot of times he calls me and I have no idea what it's for. Um, And it's important to keep that uh, discrepant, like the discreteness um, so that nothing gets revealed and such. So I just came into the studio one day, I was like not expecting anything. Um, And then, he revealed it was for the Beyonce Oscar performance. And I was just kind of mind blown. And that whole process was insane because I had no idea because she she never heard me play before. She's never seen me. So she he was just like, I, I want you here and I believe in you. Um we're gonna get through these rehearsals. Hopefully she likes you. <laughs> um <laughs> you know, as a player, as a person, whatever. Um, but it was all just kind of a shock and it all just happened so fast. Um, but yeah, I think it's a story in um, always showing up for people and and um, always doing the best that you can, no matter what the gig is. No kidding. I mean, it still blows my mind that you had to say no originally to something. But obviously, your, your talent is seen because they come back to you, go, hey, are you available now? And then, like you said, you mentioned that it, it is very discreet. They, they can't just tell you what it is. It would be mayhem and chaos showing up at the rehearsals or the auditions or have you. So in your field, what you're saying is you just 
you do your best, you be your best, you constantly practice whatever, and and you just say yes, pretty much probably almost everything until the opportunities come up is what it sounds like. Because you didn't you just recently perform? Was it the BET Awards? Yes, that was um, last Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> with, with Chloe and Hallie, right? Uh, this was uh, Chloe solo performance. Okay, that's right. Chloe yeah. solo. That's right. Yes. And because you're keeping these connections and the relationships are growing. So the trust is there. Because that's one thing I know in the music industry, that having a trust between artists, agents, booking, all, all, the, all the things, it pays off. But it's, it's, a, it's one, it, it, it takes hard work to kind of get to that point. Yes, of course. Like the trust is everything. And especially for Derek, he's, he's said that so many times to, to me, to all the other musicians he's worked with. Um, you could be the best player in the world, but if he can't trust you, he's not going to call, call you because, you know, if, are you going to show up? Are you going to, you know, do the right, are you going to play the right music? Cause sometimes even though someone's great, they, they want to play what they want to play, but it's not their job to do that. It's their job to do what the artist wants. And so you could be a great player, but he needs to trust you to, to, you know, do, to fulfill the vision. There it is. So the trust right, is because important. Because there's so much that happens behind the scenes with artists like Beyonce, artists like Chloe. You know, all of them, it's as wonderful as we love their performances. It's so important to know that so much goes on behind the scenes and so many people are an intrinsical part of it, like you said. And you don't yes. have people going off on the rails doing things or not showing up for rehearsals or just ghosting day of performance. Like, I'm sure those things happen. Luckily, you're not one of those people. <laughs> nope, so, okay. I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's let's dive into another area. And I love this story, so we need to share this. You also compose and produce scores for films. Now, you did one recently, and even though you had mentioned horror films are not your genre, they're not mine either. So high five, girl. I feel you on that one. You were given an opportunity, actually, to compose and produce for a horror film. Not only that, but they flew you to Germany, right? <laughs> so then share with us how that opened up your mind to new possibilities, because you looked at it at a different angle once you started working with that, correct? Yes, that's absolutely right. Um, I despised horror films. I couldn't get through even like 10 minutes because of like the ominous feeling that it, it made me kind of sick on the inside whenever I watched <laughs> horror films. But I then realized just scoring a horror film that the thing that makes it scary 90% of the time is the music. So being able to be behind it and be able to score something and it's not as scary anymore because now you're the one that's deciding how scary it gets. And so if it comes from you instead of someone doing it to you. So it's like me actually doing it to some of the roles are reversed. So I got to kind of experiment in that way. It was like, how, how do I want to make this scene feel versus someone just showing you a scene and, and you're scared. <laughs> so it, it was very interesting being on the flip coin, the flip side of that coin, because now I got to decide what kind of musical elements could bring this to life and to scare other people, which sounds terrible, but that's kind of the job. Don't feel bad. People pay to be scared. Don't feel bad at all. And so the name of the film is The Listing. Is there anything you can share with us about the film and, and maybe even a particular scene possibly? I mean, without revealing, because it hasn't been released yet, has it? No, it's coming out fall of this year. Nice. Okay. Yeah. And can you talk anything at all about the film without giving anything away that you're contractual, like able to, or. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, it's set in Germany. I mean, uh, cause they, they flew me out. Um, they, that's nuts. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, it's, if someone told me five years ago, I've been like, you know, it's impossible, but, um, it's set in Germany. They rented a castle. They, uh, I think some princess lives there. So they were paying that estate, I believe. But um, yes, it was like a 1700s castle 
So it has so much history and so much um, energy from the past. So just being there and kind of like observing everything and taking inspiration from that environment was so cool. But I love the storyline because oftentimes horror films I've learned just kind of have the jump scares or the gore and that's kind of it. But with this one, it was interesting because it had such a hefty uh, undertone to it um, in the sense that it explored racism and how these two um, in the plot, these two NFL players, former, former NFL players, they moved to Germany to escape the racism that they experienced in America. So they bought this castle for not much money because everyone knew it was haunted over there, but they didn't know in America it was haunted. Oh boy. <laughs> and so things start happening and they think it's because, um, it's because of their neighbor that is starting all this. And they thought their neighbor was racist and they thought, you know, he was saying like, don't, you have to move out of this castle. Like, but they're like, oh, you have a problem with like black people being in big castles. Um, and so this whole time they think it's like the neighbor, but actually it's something else entirely. It's, oh my God. That's a great story arc. So here you're right. Especially I've never been to Germany. And, you know, to, to, to think, so my mindset stuck in America <laughs> and you're right. You just hear there thinking things are happening in the castle and they think the neighbors are doing it to get them to leave because it's experience that they've, you know, and they're like, no, 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 no. It's not us. It's, not, you know, like, that's great. And I like that you touched on the fact that when you're composing it and this storyline that all influenced the music that you created, because you're right. I mean, not my favorite genre, but I give prop to like the 80s and even maybe 70s horror films because before CGI, they relied heavily on acting, suspense, and music to relay the fear. And when you have like your classics, and I have these conversations with people all the time, like um, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, Michael May Myers, the original story plot to it and the arc to it to me, what's important is you do tell a story that it can actually be relatable, that enough of it, you feel like this could happen to you. And to me, yes. that's what makes true horror. If you go outside those lines and it's so out of the, like people can't connect to it and go, ah, I'm not scared. Well, you're not scared because you don't think that'll happen to you. And it sounds like this film is bringing that, that um, formula back because it's throwing in modern day things happening to folks where you're not seeing the forest for the trees, so to speak. I like that. Now I really want to see this. Not, of course, just because you produced and composed the music for it. But now I feel like I, I want to see if, if it spooks me. But I'll probably have to watch it, like, in the middle of the day. <laughs> yeah, I, I would. <laughs> oh, and, you know, I forgot to, on the, on the last point, Natalie's watching. And she wanted to tell you a great point when we were discussing before we got into the horror thing. So thank you for that, Natalie. Thank you for those who are watching. Feel free to throw in questions or comments in the chat room. And what you just saw, I will throw it up there and we can discuss it. So now moving on, let's let's focus on congratulations, number one, on your nonprofit. Turn thank up her you. mic. Incredible what you do with that. Let's touch on that. Share with everybody why you started it and some of the projects you've completed since. Yes, so I started it um, a year ago. Officially, it started as a nonprofit. And um, one of the things that was really important to me was providing mentors and, and resources to the next generation of young uh, female musicians and music directors that are coming up. Because um, I found that I was really lucky in getting a mentor like Patrice Russian. And it's something that unfortunately a lot of other young women can't have because there aren't as many um, female musicians out there. So there's not enough to, you know, mentor these up and coming musicians and uh, people in the live music industry. Um, so that was really important to me. And I, I enlisted the help of my, my dear friends and colleagues who are, really amazing musicians, music directors, tour managers, and they all volunteered their time last year to do this six week program 
and they met with their mentees every week for about an hour each. And it was just such a great experience because now all these young women have contacts um, that they can keep up with as they progress in their career and ask for advice. Because a lot of times as a woman is like, okay, what do I do in this situation? Or, you know, what's going on? And I feel like um, there needs to be more uh, women that are mentors in the industry. And, um, and we're going to start in 2023 as well, like the official program, because 2021 was more of a pilot. Um, but we're really excited to kick that off in 2023. And also we do panels um, throughout the year to uh, kind of enlighten people about the different sides of the live music industry. So at NAM this year, we had a panel on music directors and it was such a good panel because we had uh, music directors and we had uh, women on the panel um, and we just talked about the role of the music director which is already an invisible role you don't see them on stage unless they're playing an instrument and you don't even if they're playing up there you don't know that they're the music director and so there's a lot of you know misunderstanding about what it is or what they do and then that very fact of it being so invisible um, it really doesn't help the fact that there's only like four or five working female music directors, you know, out there right now. Because I did a um, a little bit of research. I did a survey of about 28 uh, music, like concert tour documentaries, and only two of them listed um, female music directors, and both of them were Beyonce films. Um, and Beyonce was listed as one of the music directors. And then earlier in Beyonce's career, she had a music director named Kim Burst. Um, and she was listed as music director as well. So um, I put on this panel in the hopes of kind of enlightening people about the role of the music director, but also just, hey, let's try and bring more women into the fold. And everyone on the panel was just so gracious about how they can help and how men can help as well. So it was it was a great time. And we hope to continue to do more of these panels because I think not one is enough. So we need to do it at universities and different conferences so that uh, people can, can see it and start to acknowledge um, that this challenge exists. Oh my gosh, you right there, especially I thank you for doing that kudos to you for that, because it's important to know that although you only listed like a handful of women, it doesn't mean there's only a handful of women that do it. That means the door only opened for the handful of women and having having your I've always noticed like doing things at NAM really opens doors because with you with Stephanie with Natalie, like these doors have opened exponentially just for myself. And yes, please do your tours in universities. Do your tours in colleges. Start at local levels in all areas in education where uh, most schools, because of lack of funding, music is no longer part of it. Right. So that could that could be under the guise of career, you know, um, a career panel. And it has to do with music industry and especially women in the music industry. So please, we need that. We need that from folks like you. See how amazing you are? I told you. You're just... Aww. You're just that amazing. Now, okay, next question, because you play a variety of genres, everything mm -hmm. from classical, you've touched on like the rock, the hip hop, even jazz. So what is it? So here's that, because we've discussed this before. What are the differences that you've noticed from a, like a musician, a creator's perspective? And then what has been your experience with those who feel one way about a genre and then they might have a different opinion about the, you know what I'm saying? Like the, the whole nuance of mine's better than yours or yours isn't considered really music kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've been lucky enough to kind of put my foot into different doors of different genres. And it's been so fun because everything informs me as a musician. And I'm proud to say like everything I've listened from Britney Spears to, you know, Beethoven. <laughs> 
has really informed me about you know playing and and creating and um like what i've learned with beethoven and all the classical music you know i still use like for the bet awards just like the arpeggiated patterns um for that performance is straight from beethoven bach and everything i've learned in jazz informs kind of the more um contemporary like improvisation and harmonies and i studied with uh this amazing jazz pianist named russell ferrante from the yellow jackets and he's a jazz fusion guy and he he really uh brought me on to the these jazz harmonies and they still inform me in you know all the pop gigs that i do now the different harmonies that you can kind of subtly put in there to make it or to make the live performances more you know sparkly i guess you could say because i i really like it when artists they expand on their records because sometimes artists just kind of play it safe and they're like yeah let's just play it straight down and they never deviate from it but i love it when artists get to do that i've been lucky to to expand on the record and and find different ways to make it stand out and more palatable for live live use um and so everything that i've ingested <laughs> music wise has informed me um and so i whatever it is i i've been a big rock fan i love system of a down i love lincoln park look at you yes <laughs> And just the emotional rawness of it can be thrusted onto live music as well. Like everything can inform you as a musician. And that's why it kind of bothers me when people look down on whatever genre, um, because you're really missing out if you look down, like if you're a classical player and you're like, ah, oh, you know, this pop music, there's nothing to it you know, there's no depth, there's no complexity. Yes, there is if you decide to use what you have and insert it into pop. And not that it has to happen for pop to be viable, it already is, or jazz, you know, for people to say, yeah, classical, they, they're not, they're so rigid or pop, they're just too simple. Um, but I find that as long as you are striving for excellence in any genre, it can all be great. And we see that, you know, we see that in every genre. There's a reason why we have artists, we've had artists like Prince, who's considered a pop artist, but like, he he was just a genius. And he could draw on any genre yep. and make it all sound good. Oh, so, absolutely. And just because you're a classical player doesn't mean you're, you're great, or just because you're a jazz player doesn't make you great. What makes you great is just being excellent and, and striving and, you know, just really improving on your craft. So I, I never understood the, you know, the, <laughs> what do you call <laughs> it? The, the nose thing or. You yeah. Know? You know, as, as an elder, I guess I should really sort of embrace that role. You know, there are different disciplines and different genres of music for sure. Um, Classical will stand on its own always. There's there's so many components to it. Um, whether it can be replicated or not digitally with, you know, uh, sound effects on a keyboard, there's nothing that beats the live and, and the work it takes. But then you have jazz, a totally different dynamic on how you, and that's a feel, right? Jazz is a feel. You have to know what you're playing, obviously, reading music and whatnot, but the way you deliver it, it just it tells the story from the soul, right? And then when you talked about pop, yes, there is a scientific method, a formula that they use. We know this, those of us in the industry, that music that gets played, it, it guarantees it'll play. The repetition is kind of what gets stuck in your head and you can't get it out. And then you have forms like reggae right? Or Hawaiian style music, where the dynamics and the formula of those are actually healing, almost yeah. like a sound bath. So there's, and I love that, you know, as an older person, I think it's important to strive on keeping your mind open to the other possibilities of things that weren't given to you when you were younger. We can only meet people where they are. 
And I strive not only to meet people where they are, but to be receptive that I can meet you wherever I need to be to improve what I know and to grow from it. Right. So, you know, I mean, like Toki Monster, I think we discussed this off air when we were talking and, you know, an artist, her creations are incredible and her backstory with what happened with her and her health and how she overcame that, you know, was incredible. And, And there might be people who look at her art and think, that's nothing. It's like, you know, <laughs> and going back to Prince even, because when Prince was popular, media really controlled the narrative because the internet wasn't as feasible for us to Google and look up and do our own research. So we we weren't always privy to his genius unless we saw him in concert or saw, because he rarely did interviews, right? He was the most private person out there. In fact, it wasn't until he passed away were we even able to access his music online? He, he protected everything for a reason. And I love that younger folks like you can appreciate that kind of thing. And no, because that was a long time ago. He was like early 80s into the 90s. I mean, he he was still relevant up until the day he passed. But when he hit the scene, it was freaking 40, 50 years ago. So good for you, though. Good for you. I love that you touch on every it's like you never stop. It seems you're you're open to learning everything there is about every aspect of music, which I love. So in closing on this, because you do your own music, I was saying how I I refreshed and listened to the EP that's on your website, which I need to remember to let people know. So there's her website. Please go and follow her on all the socials. Follow Lisa on all the socials. You um you have three different styles of or three different songs that you have on your website where they're so different from one another. One is almost gospel. Another is about activism and you know being female, but not seen for your talent, only seen for your beauty. And then the other was more. It seems like a romantic kind of play, right? So what do you have going on now? Because don't you have new music coming out? And don't you have a performance coming up? Would you like to share those? Sure. Yes. Thank you so much for recognizing my music. Um, it's always the thrill when people are like, I liked your song. I love um, your songs. Oh, I do. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, there's there's new music coming out, I believe, next month. Um, I'll definitely update my my socials about what the dates are for those but i've been really excited about them because i've been able to write in different styles um like r b and jazz and um my voice has improved so i'm excited about that you know for my releases coming out um and also for the performances um one i can talk about is um august 5th um, I'll be performing at Outside Lands with this amazing artist named Papa Rod. Um, shout out to him. He's like this, I think the media describes him like the woozy Bill Withers, which is amazing. Oh, nice. And he's just kind of got, he has this vibe about him, which I love. Um, so we're going to be doing that. And I believe we have Afropunk in September. So that's a little ways out. Um, that's in New York and then and the outside uh, lands is in San Francisco here in California, correct? Yes, okay. it is. Um, and I believe we have a festival in Denver later this month as well. So that's, uh, something I'm really looking forward to cause I'm, I'm from Denver. Right. N- nonstop. And then to end this for those listening and are either, can you give some, maybe one or two tips on making it in the industry, particularly coming out of COVID? You know, whether, you know, whether you're new to it or you're, you want to continue it. Can you give like maybe one or two tips, especially, you know, I would say, especially as a a woman of color, you know, things that you can do that will get you noticed that might uh, put your music out there or get you on that gig with Beyonce or Chloe and Hallie. Yes. Um, yeah, like you said, the pandemic really made it hard for musicians because we couldn't perform for like two years. Um, but now that things are opening up, I would say, and I constantly have to remind myself of this too, because I'm, I still have ways to go, but meeting people is the number one thing. Like there's nothing like person to person interaction. And that was a big reminder at NAMM for me, like connecting with you in person and feeling your energy and just you know, getting along and 
it was it was just such a pleasure meeting you and and Natalie Aww, and thank Stephanie. you I feel the same about you thank you so much like I I think that's my number one thing is like be confident and also be really willing to meet people and have new experiences um I know COVID's still out there but try your best to really put yourself out there and, and go to shows and you know there's a lot of musicians that don't get acknowledged after the show so if you actually just go up and and talk to them like i actually personally know lewis cole who's an amazing jazz fusion funk artist don't know how to describe him but <laughs> you know i i like made it a point i was like i gotta meet this guy and he was just so receptive to meeting me and you just never know. And, and he's giving me a few tips on my music, um, my own music. So it works. I think just meeting people at shows and different events. Well, Nika says you're amazing and an admirable talent. So thank you for that, Nika. Oh, thank you, Nika. <laughs> Love you. I, you know, I agree. I was, as far as Nam, you know, we're all kind of still learning how to people again. Right. Um, I definitely believe that the virus is real and I'm, I'm, you know, triple vaxxed. I'll mask when I'm asked. And it was a little, I, I felt, I had to admit, I was, uh, as much as I loved coming back, I was like, how's this going to be? But I tell you, connecting on the different panels and doing our She Rocks Awards and then doing the panel with all of you reminded me how important that is. Because, you know, emails or Zoom, even Zooming, though, it's weird, like emails, texting, posts on social media. That's not the real person. You, when you're face to face with folks, the synergy is there. The energy is there. The intent is there. And then yes. the conversations are organic. And then they just they flow from there. And before you know it, great things just grow from it. So I that's a great one. Thank you for that. Especially, like you said, COVID's not. It's still here, but at least we now have a better way of protecting ourselves and handling and knowing what to do. That That's what we didn't have two years ago. So that's good. We're not the fear factor, I think, is um, we have a little more to feel secure about certain things. And uh, yeah, outside lands, please, now that I'm saying it correctly, I will do my best to come out and see that because that's a Friday. That's August. Oh. You're not too far away. I would love to see you in that and all the others. So like I said, our website's right there at elisolberg.com follow her on the socials and thank you for watching this is the women's international music network this is our podcast series live front and center you can visit our website if you want to see you know past articles or anything here at the women.com we also have she rocks podcast and now that things are opening up we're looking forward to hopefully starting in the new year doing our panels because we travel as well and we need to get you on one of those lise for sure. I would love because to. Oh my you God. and 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 with and maybe do some cross uh, collaboration with your turn up her mic as well. Cuz we appreciate all that you do. And I want to thank everybody who had comments in the section too. I love it. Look at that. Oh, Natalie, you rock. Yes. Natalie, you rock. Thanks, Natalie. <laughs> Absolutely. And this my name is Mickey Angeline and our guest here, thank you so much for being with us, Elise. And as we end out this show, like I always tell everybody, every day that you wake up, you determine how your day will go. Have a safe and wonderful weekend and 